Hello students. In the previous lecture, when I was talking about the great ideas in computer science, many of them were uh, uh, related to performance, um, improving the performance of the system by employing one idea or another. So as a side note, uh, with respect to the great ideas, even though they are named as great ideas, uh, you'd have realized that many of them are used in our day-to-day -day lives very extensively, right? So they are not uh, something totally new out of the blue stuff, right? Okay, so given that we were talking about uh, performance quite a few times, in this lecture, we are going to look at what perform performance actually means. Before uh, we get into the details, I would like to give a very, very high level view of how the performance you know, uh, can impact our program. Let's consider a simple example of sorting a set of elements. Now you're all well versed and uh, let's consider that uh, for case one, we are using an algorithm A. Uh, it can be the simple insertion or bubble or a selection sort. The time complexity would be given as some constant C1 times order of n square because they are all n square um, in time complexity. Now, let's consider an optimized uh, algorithm B, which can be either a merge sort or a heap sort. It might not be the, to uh, the best one, but uh, let's uh, take it for an example. And the time complexity is n log n and the time taken to sort n elements, t of n, can be given as uh, a constant c2 times order of n log n. Now, the, the time we are taking is heavily dependent on the number of elements and the order that is quite obvious. That's what you would have studied in your algorithm scores also. But what about the constants C1 and C2? Now, these, uh, let's try to plot the time it would take to sort n elements using the better algorithm like a merge sort and see how the value of constant C2 affects the overall time. So here you have a graph wherein on the x-axis, you have the number of elements, right? From 1, 10, 100, so on, almost uh, 10 lakhs. And on the y-axis, you have the time in nanoseconds. So if you look at the last set of data points here, for different values of C2, the constant from, as we increase from 1 to 1.5 to 2 and 2.5, you see that the same algorithm is taking different amount of time and for based on the constant it can be twice or more than that slower than uh, the constant which is having let's say the value of one what does it convey using the best algorithm yes it does help but we do need to worry about the constant also when you are actually running this algorithm on a system. Now computer architecture specifically helps us to determine these constants. The influence of architecture in the value of these constants is very high. So if you build better architectures, the value of the constant will be lower. So accordingly, the same algorithm will be working much faster on some a newer system or a better system. So uh, I thought uh, you being um, many of the many of you would be uh, quite interested in coding and uh, I found a very good link on sorting algorithms. It's on the screen. You can go through it uh, if you like. Now looking at the term performance. When we say that a, a computer it has a better performance than another, what do we really mean? Is it uh, 
is it only the speed or something else let's look at an analogy and then uh, come back to this question okay the analogy i have picked up is uh, uh, different types of aeroplanes and how do we compare or choose the best among them here let's say is the table uh, which has four different aeroplanes boeing 777 boeing 747 and uh, Concorde and DC850 and each for each of them there are different parameters that have been listed for example uh, the first one is passenger capacity in this regard Boeing 747 has the highest capacity the cruising range if we consider then DC850 has the highest cruising range if you uh, consider cruising speed then Concorde has the highest speed and let's say there is a derived parameter which is multiplying their pa passengers to the speed then Boeing 747 has the highest uh, value here now if somebody asks you which of these airplanes is good or the best how do we answer do we consider uh, only the passenger capacity or only the speed or do we consider the range or will we uh, pick some other uh, derived parameter on these and then determine so the point i'm trying to convey is comparing two different aeroplanes is not so straightforward because there are multiple parameters that have an or uh, impact or if you are any day-to-day -day customer or uh, customer in the sense the traveler all we might look at is the ticket price whichever has whichever airline airline not even the aero, uh, specific uh, aeroplane has the least price we would go with that right so all these parameters which would be technically uh, giving us some insight will be brushed aside and we'll just pick the guy who is having the lowest uh, price in the same way when we want to compare one computer computer to another it's not not so straightforward because we have we do have multiple parameters like the power it would consume or the uh, cooling it would require or it can be the most obvious thing that is the time it would take now let's uh, try to compare two desktop computers now by doing so what we are also do, uh, restricting is the area it would take and the power it would take because more or less all the desktop computers might fall in the same um, tdp range now if we want to compare such computers and uh, how would we say one computer is better than the other whichever is running the program faster can be termed as a better computer so the time taken by the single program has helped us to determine which of these desktop computers is better now let's say we are considering not desktop computers or uh, the pcs but rather we are looking at data centers what data centers typically do is handle millions of jobs or millions of queries or millions of tasks from so many uh, users simultaneously so in such cases Typically, we would look at the number of tasks or jobs that are completed by one data center in a day or for one particular unit of time. It can be a second or an hour or a day. This can be one other metric. So for desktop computers, it was the time taken for one single program. But when we looked at the data centers, it can be the number of jobs that we have completed. So the first one is called response time or execution time. It is defined as the total time that a computer would take to complete or execute a task. It would include everything. Now, what everything means, we are going to look at uh, in a slide or two later. And the other end is what's called throughput or bandwidth. That would be typically, typically <coughs> sorry, defined as the number of tasks that we are completing per a unit of time. 
similar to the response time and bandwidth for uh, the performance of computers on the memory front if we are just considering the memory it can be the cache or the main memory or the secondary memory there are two uh, metrics latency it is defined as the time required per one data item and the other one is bandwidth the amount of data we can transfer per second uh, so you would already be aware about this uh, mbps or kbps or gbps term that's typically the bandwidth now if you want to see how the response time and throughput throughput are affected by one another let's take an example if you want to replace a processor with a faster version of itself and when we are trying to run uh, a program will the response time be affected or the throughput it would be the response time because we have a better version of the processor the same program would run faster now if you want to add more and more processes to our uh, computer which one would be affected is it the response time or the throughput even though we have multiple processors if the uh, earlier processor and these processors are same then the response time would still be same but now let's say we moved from single core to four cores in a four core setup we would effectively can handle four programs simultaneously so the throughput can be improved but in in general in many of the real uh, computer systems if we are changing the response time it can have a, an impact on throughput or the other way around that's the way the design is for example let's say we are when we are replacing uh, the processor with a faster one it would also mean that if we have 10 tasks earlier in the older processor if they were taking 10 seconds and let's say the newer processor is uh, taking half of the time it would mean that the same 10 tasks would take 5 seconds so the throughput also has increased right so there is an interplay between the execution time and throughput we'll start by looking at the response time now if you want to define the performance it would be equal to 1 upon the execution time now to improve the performance the very obvious thing is to decrease the execution time using this simple uh, performance definition let's try to understand what relative performance is now when we want to compare a system or a computer x with another computer y how do we compare it we would we would say that x is n times faster than y what does it actually mean is the program when it's run on x and when it's on run on y the if and if you want to look at the ratio it would be 1 by n it means that uh, let's say n is 10 if on y it was taking 10 seconds on x it would take only one second to run another way of putting it is x performance is n times y it means that uh, x was 10 times faster than y okay now how do we measure because we already defined it as one upon execution time time is the measure for the computer performance it's typically measured as seconds per program it's too uh, coarse grain we are going to look at much more finer uh, way of measuring the performance typically the response time or the execution time is the latency of execution of one task to its completion and it will in it will involve the access to the disk which is the secondary memory and the primary memory and even uh, the io activity and the operating system overhead itself all these will contribute to the execution time now to uh, to quickly understand what it would mean let's say you want to sort 10 elements 
now the execution time also considers the time the user it means us by uh, the time we take to enter the 10 elements this is very uh, very uh, coarse grain measure because different users enter the numbers at different speeds now how can we comment on the program when the time we are trying to measure or look at is dependent on the user so in order to avoid that we are going to define another metric before that as well, on the side point in general we use uh, or we run multiple programs on the computer at any given moment of time now exactly how many uh, seconds the computer was executing our program means program 1 and not executing another program 2 is very hard to differentiate if you are just looking at execution time with this motivation just if you want to look at the time the cpu the central power processing unit is actually executing the program it would be defined as cpu time what it means is all the other overheads of the disk accesses io accesses the os and the user or remote and the number of uh, seconds or nanoseconds or we will have another metric the, that the program is getting actually executed is given by CPU time. The metric of seconds is again uh, too big because now we have typically when we talk about any computing resource, we talk about when we talk about its frequency, it's typically gigahertz, if not more. So gigahertz would translate into nanoseconds. Now nanoseconds is too, uh, uh, too small um, for the typical uh, user. So what we have is a relative metric which is called CPU clock. It is a measure that relates to how fast the hardware per can perform some basic functions like Add, adding, subtracting, multiplication, etc. We would say that adder would take one cycle instead of saying that adder would take one nanosecond. Because when the hardware, <coughs> excuse me, when the hardware scales with the technology scaling, the same adder can uh, take 0.5 nanoseconds. But with the improved uh, uh, um, Adder also, we would still say it is one one clock cycle, but each clock cycle is 0.5 nanoseconds. But in the first case, it is one nanosecond. But in both of them, it would still take one clock cycle. That's the way we would refer to it. It's easier. So what does a clock mean? It is one rising edge and one falling edge. So the Time period between two rising edges or two falling edges is called clock period. Typically, the data transfer and computation happen after some point of the rising edge and they end before, well before the falling edge. So you can see a small uh, hexagon here, which is leaving some time before the falling edge and after the uh, sorry before the rising edge and after the rising edge it's called uh, setup and hold time uh, uh, constraints and all, all the uh, systems need to adhere to them but uh, the simplest thing is the time between two rising edges or falling edges is called a clock period the clock period would be given as uh, uh, typically 250 picoseconds or it, the same can be written as 0.25 nanoseconds or it can be uh, said to be 250 times 10 power minus 12 seconds. Now if you observe for each of these the units are varying but the actual value is still same. 1 upon clock period is clock frequency and it would be typically given as uh, 4 gigahertz or 400 megahertz or it can be 4 times 10 power 9 hertz so it, similar to the 
clock period, the units are varying, but the actual value is still same. In this course, whenever we refer to clock cycles or clock ticks or ticks or clock period or in general, the simplest clock, they all refer to the one, uh, one and the same. Okay, do not get confused. As a side note, I would also I would uh, like to point out that units are very, very important. So do not ignore them whenever you are performing any calculations. Even though the value uh, can be correct, if the unit is off, then the actual answer is wrong. So keep that in mind whenever uh, you are doing any performance calculations or in general, any calculations in the course. Okay. Now the term CPU time that we have mentioned earlier is given as the total number of clock cycles, CPU clock cycles times the clock cycle time. It can also be given as CPU clock cycles upon the clock rate or the clock frequency. Now, if you want to understand how we can improve the performance, it would be either reducing the number of clock cycles or increasing the clock rate. Quite obvious, right? If you want to, uh, if we run the same program on a faster processor, it would uh, complete faster. The first term is reducing the number of clock cycles is where we spend most of our time with, uh, in this course. How do we reduce the overall clock cycles of one particular program? And many a times we'll also understand that we as hardware architects or hardware designers will need to trade off the clock rate and the clock cycles. At appropriate time, I'm going to highlight this. With all this uh, uh, basic equation, let's uh, look at a simple example. Let's say our program uh, runs, takes 10 seconds to run on computer A and computer A uh, ticks at two gigahertz clock. Now we uh, we are trying to help a computer designer build a computer B and we want the same program to take six seconds in on it. For such a requirement, the designer has determined that a substantial increase in the clock rate is possible, but this will increase the rest of CPU design resulting in computer B requiring 1.2 times more the number of clock cycles when compared to computer A. Now with this problem statement, the question is what is the clock rate of computer B? If we uh, use the previous equation for computer A, 10 seconds is equals to X clock cycles upon 2 gigahertz clock rate. For B, it would be 6 seconds equals to 1.2 times X because that's what is given. That computer B would require 1.2 times the number of clock cycles upon Y. And we need to determine Y. It's a simple calculation. Y would come to 4 gigahertz. It means that to make the same program take six seconds on computer B, it, it needs to tick at four gigahertz. Typically, the a program is sequence of instructions. Now, in the CPU time that we saw, there were no instructions in it. All it had was the number of clock cycles and clock cycle time or clock rate. Now, where do we uh, bring in the instructions? clock cycles is equal to the total number of instructions in the program times the number of clock cycles each instruction would take. The second term is called CPI. We are going to look at it. The CPU time equals to instruction count times CPI times the clock cycle time. We have just replaced the clock cycles in the previous CPU time equation or it can be given as instruction count times CPI upon clock rate. Simple. What does CPI mean? Clock cycles per instruction, as the name says, is the average number of clock cycles each instruction 
takes to execute okay some of the instructions can be uh, very complex for example if you want to perform multiplication of two numbers it can take more number of clock cycles than an instruction let's say to add two numbers okay we would need to consider the cycles for each instruction and appropriately calculate the cpi it's a quick point on the instruction count this instruction count is not the number of instructions that are in the program but rather it is the dynamic instruction count meaning the total number of instructions that actually got executed for this program to complete now to understand it let's say our program has six instructions instruction 1 2 3 4 and 5 let's say we have executed instruction 1 followed by 2 3 4 5 6 and then uh, let's say these instructions are part of a loop let's say for loop or while loop okay then what we do is we need to go back to instruction 1 and execute it again that's how a typical loop works right now if we look at the simple program we would say that it has only six instructions but if let's say the loop is uh, 100 times what it means is to execute this program we are executing not six but 600 instructions so that's called dynamic instruction count okay it is uh, different than the number of instructions that we see in a typical program now with all these points if you want to understand what are all the factors that are influencing the program it would be the dynamic instruction count and it is primarily determined by the instruction set architecture and compiler the second one is the clock cycle time this is primarily de uh, dependent on the fabrication technology and how the logic blocks are organized in a computer and the third is average cycles per instruction again it is primarily determined by the cpu hardware for example if you want to uh, add two 64 bit elements or numbers um, instead of ripple carry adder if you use a carry look adder it works faster what it affects is the cycles per instruction like i said it's primarily by uh, determined by the determined by the cpu hardware means both organization of the logic blocks and the instruction set architecture have a say on this we are going to look at uh, points 1 and 3 in the module 1 how the isa influences the performance let's look at an example suppose for the same instruction set architecture don't worry at this moment what instruction set architecture means uh, just understand that it's an agreement between the software and hardware for the same instruction set architecture we can have multiple different hardware designs here we have a problem where we have two such designs computer a has clock cycle time of 250 picoseconds and cpi is 2 for a program and computer b has clock cycle time of 500 picoseconds and cpi of 1.2 now if you want to determine for this particular program which computer is faster we need to use the cpu time for a it would be instruction count times 2 times 250 picoseconds for b it is instruction count times 1.2 times 500 picoseconds now you can ask why is the instruction count same in both in computer a and b that's because the they are they are designed for the same instruction set architecture okay with this calculation we can determine that a is 1.2 times faster than computer b another example a given application written in java runs 15 seconds on a desktop processor a new java compiler is released 
that requires only 0.6 as many instructions as the old compiler. It means that we have built an efficient compiler and that has reduced the number of instructions. Unfortunately, it increases the CPI by, by 1.1. It means that we, though we are able to reduce the number of instructions, we are using some uh, complex uh, operations that uh, need more than one cycle, specifically 1.1 cycles. Now, with these uh, parameters, how fast can we expect that application to run using the new compiler? Just like the previous equation, use it and you would get that on the with the new compiler, it would take 9.9 .9 seconds. Earlier it was 15 seconds. So it is quite faster. Like I mentioned earlier, different instructions can have different CPI. So what we look at is not the CPI of individual instructions, but rather a group of instructions, which is called instruction mix. And this we calculate what's called average CPI. The simple operations like uh, addition, subtraction, and or they all typically are much faster than multiplication, division, and uh, anything um, which involves a combination of these. So, to get an overall understanding of how much average CPI. Is there for one particular program? We analyze that program, we segregate them into different instruction types, and we multiply that with their appropriate CPI. That way, we would get the overall CPU cycles, and from there, we can calculate the average CPI being it would be the summation of a type of instruction times the number of times that type of instruction has been encountered or on on upon or all the instruction count. So let's say our uh, dynamic instruction count of a program is 100 and we have 10 addition instructions and the CPI of uh, addition operation is 1. So it would be 1 times 10 upon 100. Let's say uh, in the same program, Multiplication uh, takes two cycles and there are 50 multiplication instructions. Then this would be two times 50 upon 100. So on so forth uh, with different types of instructions, we can calculate the average CPI. So here is one uh, quick example for you to understand. Let's say we have used a different compiler to generate different combination of uh, instructions for the same program. So here we have uh, three instruction classes A, B, and C. Let's say they are um, small arithmetic instructions here, then these are multiplications, and these are, let's say, divisions. Now the CPI for uh, class A is 1, class B is 2, and class C is 3 cycles. The instruction count in sequence 1 by Compiler 1 is it would generate a program that has two A type instructions, A class instructions, and one B class instruction, and two C class instructions. When we used compiler 2, the same program is, was having four A class instructions, one B class instruction, and one C class instruction. So, with these numbers, we can calculate the average CPI and accordingly determine which sequence is better or runs faster sequence 1 generated by compiler 1 or sequence 2 generated by compiler 2 i leave it to you for as a, a take home exercise work it out with all this now let's look at what's called as the classic cpu performance equation this would also give us the bigger picture the cpu time is given as the total number of dynamic instructions per program times 
the clock cycles per instruction the cpi times the seconds upon clock cycle this would be the speed at which our hardware is running this is the average cpi and here is the dynamic instruction count now if you want to understand what program performance would be affected by the algorithm that you pick will be affecting the instruction count and possibly the cpi because uh, maybe your algorithm has fewer instructions but it would pick some compl uh, complex operations so the cpi can change the programming language that you pick to implement your algorithm will affect the instruction count and cpi the compiler that we use will again uh, affect the instruction count and cpi if you are not already aware your compiler has different levels of optimization when you actually compile a program based on those uh, optimization levels the instruction count and cpi can vary and the at the end we also have the instruction set architecture that has a say on almost all of them instruction count average cpi and the clock cycle now you might be wondering where is the programmer coming into the picture the programmer will pick the best algorithm will pick the programming language that he is comfortable with and write the program and the compiler will do the rest of the job of generating the assembly code or the machine code and then the hardware will execute it whatever the programmer is his role only limited to picking the algorithm and the programming language no it's also the duty of the programmer to write very smart codes removing all the redundant calculations no uh, concising his logic all these uh, contribute to your instruction count and cpi the, uh, this might not be very obvious to a lame programmer but we being computer science students and specifically in architecture course you need to see uh, how your uh, smart programming would actually improve the performance Th this is the reason some of the programming contests not only look at your uh, final solution they also look at how much time that solution would take so keep this in mind whenever uh, you're coding okay with that i will stop this lecture and the next lecture is uh, a very interesting topic um, we are going to look at some of the walls of computer architecture walls in the sense the limiting factors that uh, over the decades right from the uh, point when the notion of personal computer began what were the hindrances or difficulties that computer architect faced and how they have overcome it and are they still persisting or not etc okay with that uh, i'll pause this lecture thank you